All right, we are live. We are live. Welcome to the Fox Rod CR podcast. This is your host, Franco Sonera, and here we go. And welcome back to the Fox Show Sierra podcast. And this is your host, Franco Sonera. Okay, a couple quick announcements. Um, Instagram. Uh, follow me on Instagram where I post uh, various short stories and clips of my podcast. Uh, yeah, just give me a follow. And I should like this video on your way in so I can actually level up in the algorithm so I can give you the sweet content. And yeah. Okay, uh, YouTube search. Um, follow me on the Fox Show Sierra podcast. Uh, this is how you search me so I can find this logo right here give it a follow please like my videos on the way in and reddit uh same thing with uh instagram uh follow me on reddit uh reddit.com slash you slash lock trots here pod and last but not least tiktok yeah i kind of did something uh i did a thing and that thing is i open up a tiktok so again short uh sh- short clips i'm gonna be posting on tiktok and maybe uh, a few more war stuff there i don't know i haven't really worked out the uh the whole uh tweaks and adjustments on tiktok i'm still relatively somewhat new to the uh to the app so yeah and uh, that's about it on your way in like and video please subscribe to the channel guys all right all right So, with that being said, let's get on. Let's uh, review uh, one last episode, uh, episode 17, the uh, Battle Britain. Uh, We went over the, uh, well, we went went over Operation Catapult, which is the, which is British uh, Task Force H, uh, sailed to uh, French, French Algerian waters, because at the time it's now under, uh, Vichy control and the Vichy government is under the collaboration of the Nazi government. Otherwise, it's a it's a puppet state, you can call it. So anyway, uh the British uh navy gave the uh the French Admiral an ultimatum, and the ultimatum was not met, so Task Force H didn't have a choice but to open up fire on their own allied ships. Winston Churchill himself signed off on it and he quoted himself it was one of was one of his most regretful decisions he's ever made and i think it kind of started a drinking problem to be honest with you in other words he he really didn't take the, didn't take it very very lightly and yeah so it was either that or have those ships have in possession of the Kriegsmarine for a for a launch pad on the German amphibious amphibious invasion on southern England, which kind of led to the Battle of Britain and Eagle Day. Uh, Eagle Day is a series of uh, Luftwaffe attacks on RAF air, airfields. It went from airfields to uh, bombing cities because what the whole ha- what happened was. Uh, a few Heinkel bombers went off course, and they were trying to bomb a British oil refinery, but they were bo- they bombed residential areas by mistake, and the and the British people were like, "Yeah, where was that? What? What the fuck? How dare you?" So they, in retaliation, they started bombing German cities. Uh, first one on target is Berlin, and Berlin was like. <laughs> Holy hell, this is getting closer to our home than you think. So, in retaliation, German cities starts bombing 
the British cities right back. And to top it all off, we went over uh, the Kinnikabine system. The Kinnikabine system is the German night attacks where uh, they figured out how to uh, navigate throughout the dark. And so they can bomb Britain day and night. It was the whole idea that uh, it was to bomb Britain into submission. Which kind of reluctantly failed at the end, which we all know why, because Britain never surrendered. Like, she'll never surrender. <laughs> and so, and so, yeah. And oh, yeah, we went over the, the doubting system as well. Again, the doubting system was a uh, series of, um, of communication system, pretty much a early, an, an early advanced warning system at the time. So you have observers, and then you have the radar system, a uh, series of. Um... Actually, go back to my last episode. Give it a like on your way in. I might have to redo that episode as well, though. But yeah, it was it was, seri- it was a series of uh, it was a system. You you go from observers to radars to um, uh, to. Hang on, let's see my. I was gonna review my notes here. Hold on. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. Goes to the flight command. Flight command reports that to the airfields, and airfields will just launch your Spitfire. As I got right here, this is a Spitfire Mark IV. Hmm? I got Instagram here on the way in there as well. <laughs> so, as you can see, it differs from the Spitfire Mark I. Because the Mark One would have their wings kind of uh, like smooth, but this one's kind of cut in order for like you know aerial maneuverable purposes. Uh, that's model that I made. That's kind of shit compared to the ones that I've seen in museums. Oh, they look like miniature toys. Uh, anyway, one of the aircrafts that. That used and my and the four phases of the Battle Britain, but uh, but fuck all that. Let's get back to the show. Okay, the, ba- the Battle of the Atlantic. All right, I'll show you this article over here. All right, this is a uh, column to the Canadian Encyclopedia. Uh, the Let's read this article right here. Okay. The Battle, the battle of the Atlantic from 1939 to 1945 was the longest continuous battle of the Second World War. So it li- literally started from beginning to end. Okay. It wasn't like D-Day. It wasn't like the Battle of North Africa or the North African Campaign or Operation Barbosa. Anything like that. The Battle of the Atlantic li- literally went from, start from, hang on, let's see right here. Uh, oh, this is the update from... It was the 3rd of September to the the 8th of May, 1945. That's when practically the German army surrendered. Okay. Uh, Canada played a key role in the Allied struggle for control of the North Atlantic as German submarines, the U-boats, uh, worked furiously to crypt the convoy shipping cr- crucial supplies to Europe. Uh Victory was costly. More than 70,000 Allied seamen, merchant, mariners, and airmen lost their lives, including approximately 4,400 4, from Canada and Newfoundland. Many civilians also lost their lives, including 136 passengers of the ferry SS Caribou. Okay, I kind of want to show you the SS Athena, which kind of like, you know, kicked off the uh, the Second World War for us com- com- British Commonwealth people and the British people themselves. Uh, second of the Caribou. Okay, the SS Caribou was a passenger and train ferry that operated at the uh, Cabot Strait between Port of uh, Basique, Newfoundland, and North Sydney, Nova Scotia. On 14th of to- October 1942, the German submarine U-69 sank the vessel, causing the worst loss of life in Canadian waters during the Second World War. So, the war was heading closer to us, as it always has been since Pretty much kicked off off the war, and we had stuff like this happening in Canadian waters. Hey, go to the Canadian Encyclopedia if you want to check this stuff out. But anyway, uh, right here is the uh, the Canadian Corvette that challenged the U boats at the time, uh, HMCS to Halifax. 
uh, was a typical cheap seaworthy Corvettes built to counteract the German U-boats during that time. And as you can see here, oh, it's it's seen better days. But it sank U-boats. That's all it's there for, man. Yeah, here we go. 3rd September 1939 till 8th of May 1945. And these were the participant powers that were involved. Now let's talk about Canadian casualties. Uh, 2,000 sailors of the Royal Canadian Navy. And you have 16,000 merchant mariners from Canada and Newfoundland. And these merchant mariners, they were civilian civilian sailors tr just trying to get supplies from uh, Canada to England or Canada to the United Kingdom. Because we're talking about Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well. Of course, uh, 752 airmen of the Royal Canadian Air Force, the RCAF. All right. This is what we're going to talk about right here. Uh, the first shots on the Atlantic were fired on the 3rd September 1939, just hours after Britain declared war on Germany. Uh, Transatlantic, at the time, uh, in order to get from continent to continent, uh, it we it didn't have any long range flights at the time. Hang on, let's put, put this here on. All right, there we go. Gotcha. All right, it really wasn't. Um, we didn't have long range flights at the time. And so at the time, we uh, had to use ships from, again, going, going from continent to continent. It will take like up to uh, 12 weeks at least. It was pretty much your. It was practically your your home till then. And um yeah, you have uh people from different nationalities and these people uh from the SS Athenia. Uh it was departing from Liverpool and its destination was it to Montreal. And its passengers, again, groups of nationalities. You have Americans trying to get back to America, you have Canadians, Canadians trying to get back to Canada. And you have Jewish refugees trying to escape the soon-to-be Nazi Europe. And so the U-boat U-130, under the uh, the command of Lieutenant Fritz Joseph Lemp, fires the Athena in error, thinking that it's a Allied merchant ship, but really didn't record, didn't log it in his notebook because. By the time he figured it out, was an actual, not a merchant ship. He was like, <laughs> "Holy, <laughs> I <laughs> up pretty badly." As so, oh, can't do anything about it afterwards. And the sinking of the Athena was a condemned as a international war crime. Uh, people were just going. How dare you! Left, right, and center. Uh, but uh, get this. Uh, Joseph Goebbels at the time. Um, hang on, let's right here. Yeah, you, you kind of read this uh, article by now, so. All right. Okay, so uh. Joseph Gable's kind of like, you know, kind of turned us into a uh, kind of little conspiracy like. On purpose, they fired on the Athena, sinking its own passenger ship, passenger ship to make Germany look bad. They were saying it's practically fake news. You are like... fake news. <laughs> Hang on. You are fake news. <laughs> Yo, it's going like that. And some people actually believed it. Even Americans believed it for a minute. Until then, take, it, it didn't take the entire world that long to realize, hey, these are Nazis here. They're, they're known to be liars and narcissists and all that evil stuff. So it didn't take long for them to know it's actually, actually they're full of <laughs> and they actually sank the Athena. But it wasn't intentional. Legit, uh, Lieutenant Limp. Oh, uh, fr uh, sorry, fr fr uh, Fritz Julius Limp. There we go. That's the guy's name. He did uh, fire the Athenian uh, by accident. 
like it was by accident. It was it was on purpose, but whatever. It was war. It is what it is, though. But you can't excuse for the people that actually die in in that ship. Yeah, 112 people were killed, including four Canadians. All right, for a brief amount of time, okay. So, in order to react to uh, the sinking of the SS Athena, the, uh, the Royal Canadian, I'm oh, sorry, okay. Actually, the, the Royal Navy actually uh, did a, what do you call it, a, um, a, a U boat counteroffensive, kind of a uh, repeat of what they did at the uh, First World War. So, again, they tried to uh, do a blockade at the North Sea. Which I will show you right here. Like I'm going to open up Google Maps, or not Google Maps, Google Earth. All right. I got a lot of screens open. There we go. I don't know exactly where the North Sea is. All right. Okay, so right in this vicinity area, where I decided, where Britain decided to uh, do another repeat of the First World War uh, naval blockade, uh, kind of prevented from the Kriegsmarine from launching their U-boats, but. Unfortunately, during the Battle of France, that shot that to uh, DL Satan and I kind of broke down together. Uh, France, of course, surrendered to Nazi Germany. Okay. So these new advanced U boats, however, can actually counter the blockade and since the fall of France, uh, Field Marshal Patan, now President Patan of the new Vichy French government, surrendered to the Nazis and had to surrender its French ports, which, which is along the French coastline over here. Uh, a lot of the creeks were in access to practically the open seas. So, since they have access to the open seas, they can now sink like ships right over here. And this is where practically the Battle of the Atlantic took place. All right. Okay. This is what I got for you right here. Okay, the first battle. I'm going to show you uh, Scapa Flow. Okay, uh, before I pop it over at uh, Google Earth again, uh, it was located at the uh, Orkney Islands uh, over up uh, northern Scotland. It's a pretty much a, uh, a system of islands at the north of the British Isles. Uh, Carl Dunas at the time, uh, commander of the uh, the U-boat fleet, uh, orders to be soon to be soon to be ace uh, Gunther Prien to set sail towards Scapa Flow and sink the British ship uh, HMS uh, Royal Oak. So the HMS Royal Oak is a obsolete battleship, though. But yet again, it is the uh, the pride and joy of the Royal Navy. So it's a it's a flagship, a symbol of uh, its own military power. Of course, Gunther Preen kind of sneaks his way into Scapa Flow and sinks HMS Royal Oak. Uh, fortunately, 833 of its crew members were killed. And so Gunther, Gunther Preen returns back to uh, its own German ports with, with the hero's welcome. In fact, uh, Dunitz con congratulates him personally. You know, gives him wine, champagne, and he will do this to... The other U boat aces throughout uh, 1939 through 1941. Uh, it's his way of uh, getting, uh, trying to get uh, 300 U boats off the bat. Because he believed that, you know, his words himself, uh, if I have 300 U boats, I can break Britain. All right. 
Okay, so uh, he kind of like tried, tries to create uh, clout, as we can call it. <laughs> clout for uh, his Kriegsmarine, because he needs recruitment. He needs U-boats. He needs to convince Adolf, Adolf Hitler himself that surface vessels are not the thing anymore. In order to combat uh, the British convoys, we need U-boats, submarines. Uh, sink them through stealth. But, but at the time, uh, his boss... Uh, Admiral uh, Eric Reiter, uh, he was he was the commander in chief of the Kriegsmarine uh, from the first of June 1935 to uh, 30th of January 1943. Uh, I think it was sooner than that. But anyway, uh, he first rejected uh, Dunitz's uh, request for 300 U boats since the start of the war. He kind of favored big ships. Uh, well, guys like him, uh, you know, shout out to DL Saint for saying this. Um, generals are always fighting the last war, but what he, what DL means by that is they're following old strategies from previous combats, thinking, oh, if, it, oh, they're thinking, of, oh, if this is what, this worked well from my last war or my, my last battle, it probably work on this new battle, this new war, which is not the case. In fact, it is complete opposite. Because the opposition are is always adapting, always overcoming, always creating new ways to defend the, to to defend itself. So, uh, Adolf Hitler prefers big battleships because you know the guy's an egotistic man. So uh, big things, he he likes big things. Well, then again, he's Always oh, hype on drugs all the time, so yeah. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's the case after all. But yeah. No, but anyway, uh Dunitz kept campaigning. If I had three hundred U boats, I can break Britain. So again, like he would bring like he'll go as far as bringing the press over, taking photographs and whatnot, personally greeting them, blah blah blah. But yeah. And this uh, map I'll show you right here. Um, okay, this is where basically the uh, the Atlanta took place right here. And I kind of blew it up uh, to exactly where it took place. Get a good look. And for those of you on Instagram, go on YouTube. Like the video on your way in so I can level up the algorithm. All right, and right here, this is the SS Athenia. Then the ship that was at the wrong place at the wrong time. <sighs> Unfortunate. All right. The man himself, Admiral Carl Dunitz, uh, commander in chief of the U boat fleet. Uh, he was a uh, he was he was a very charismatic of a person. He was told, I was told. Uh, he was very respected by most of the sailors of the Kriegsmarine. Uh, as far they gave him uh, nicknames, as far as um, saying uh, Uncle Carl or the Lion, those were his two nicknames. Uh, he was also he was also a uh, what do you call it a a punctual person, a very 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 micromanaging man. So when, whenever he when he does uh, reports of his U-boats in the Atlantic, he wants to know exactly where they are, how much torpedoes they have left, uh, how, how much uh, merchant ships they sank, or any warships they sank, and how much fuel they have. And that created a problem, which I will show you later. No, so, but, okay. Uh, his strategy. Uh, Britain gets 70% uh, of their imports overseas. So, again, like, if he had 300 U-boats, he can do the job. So he would have uh, 100 uh, overseas, another 100 rotating, and another 100 doing um, training, repairs, whatever. Uh, but the Kriegsmarine only had, like, less than 50 U-boats uh, since the, uh, the start of the war. And... This bow, this battleship right here. Uh, keep keep this in mind right here. The battleship Bismarck. This is the ship that Hitler kind of prefer over uh, D 
Dunix, uh, Dunix's, uh, 300 U-boats. Okay. The Bismarck, uh, Germany's most powerful battleship. Okay, uh, if you want to uh, mark your, what I call your your place in uh, in sea power, you gotta have battleships. Uh, battleships at the time uh, represents uh, naval power. Uh, today, right now, you c- aircraft carriers re- kind of represent uh, naval power. Like more aircraft carriers you have, the more of a threat you are, which. Because when if World War Three kicks off, the first uh, the first targets would be were our aircraft carriers. And why is aircraft carriers important? I don't know. Uh, Pearl Harbor, Midway, Coral Sea. Ooh, I can explain that on my next episode. <laughs> oh, but okay. Okay, so the Bismarck uh, represented one quarter of the Kriegsmarine strength. Uh, it weighed uh, 50,000 50, tons, fully loaded. Uh, okay, at the uh, okay, the League of Nations, well, the United Nations at the time, had this rule for um, for uh, shipyard building. It can it, it cannot weigh more than thirty thousand tons. Uh, Britain's heaviest ship. Actually weighs thirty thousand tons, which is the uh, King George the Fifth battleship. Uh, however, the German Kriegsmarine breaches it like all the battleships weighs above thirty thousand. Okay, so anyway, uh, the Bismarck can go up to uh, thirty knots, and it's uh, two hundred fifty-one meters in length. Ho ho ho! This is a big beast. What do you call it right here? And oh. And the uh, the next ship is the Prince Eugen, another uh, heavy battleship. And it was escorting the uh, the Bismarck. And okay, so hunting the hunting the Bismarck. Uh, Dunitz wanted again wanted his three hundred U boats to defeat Britain, but <laughs> that request was undermined by Raider. And their Dunitz is like nine 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 nine. So he continues to. Uh, campaign his uh his u-boat request again visiting uh the u-boat aces having photographs of them give him champagne give him the clout give him the women blah 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 and yeah like he wasn't short on sailors he was short on u-boats you know what that this this changed after the uh after this event i'm which I'm about to show you right here okay So I'm going to, this uh, map over here is in numbers. Uh, Go from, let's go counterclockwise, from the 1 o'clock back to the 3 o'clock. Or sorry, back to the uh, the 5 o'clock. Uh, this picture right here complements to uh, the big textbook uh, right over here. Uh, World War II by uh, Smith, Smithsonian. All right. So, number one. Uh, 21st of May, Bismarck and Prince Eugen sit. Uh, set sail from the Norwegian harbors in, 19, in 1941. Uh, battleship Prince of Wales and battle cruiser Hood dispatches from Scapa Flow, which is these guys over here. And okay, so uh, 23rd of May, uh, German ships detected by cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk using the new radar system. Okay, so pick these pick these guys up. And therefore, like the Norfolk, uh, the HMS Norfolk, the HMS Suffolk isn't going to challenge the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. Like it's, they prefer uh, the Hood and the Prince Wales since they're they're heavy enough, and figure that it would take on the Bausch of Bismarck and the Prince Eugen. But that's not the case because 24th of May, uh, the Battle of Denmark Strait uh, kicks off. Uh, Hood and Prince uh, Hood and Prince of Wales engaged the Bismarck and the Prince Hugo. Uh, I forget who I uh, was it either uh, Prince of Wales or the Hood uh, fires their their salvos their salvos at the, at the Bismarck but misses, and unfortunately, uh, Bismarck loads up her guns, got Hood right at her sights. 
blast that ship, and apparently it was a incredible explosion. And of course, uh, Prince Hugin and Bismarck took some hits. They took some decent hits. And same with uh, the Prince of Wales. Prince of Wales was lucky that it didn't sank along with the hood. In fact, it couldn't carry the fight, so it had to retreat. And at this point, the World Navy knew that the Bismarck is a threat. And that threat has to be eliminated. So, 24th of May at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, HMS Hood is sunk. And the HMS Hood was, again, like like the uh, like the Royal Oak, uh, it was another pride, pride and joy of the Royal Navy. Again, it was a symbol of the Royal Navy. Okay, so the, the British lost two of their the crown ships. So there's like what? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> like that's it. Lock and load, baby. We're going in for the kill. So, the home fleet from Scapa Flow. Oh, I was supposed to show you Scapa Flow. That's my mistake. Hang on, hang on. I apologize, folks. There we go. Oh. Hang on, let's go off to the north right over here. Uh, guys. I like the video on your way in because what kind of content creator will actually show you some sweet content like this? <laughs> All right, over here. Scapa flow, baby. There is the the Orkney Islands. This whole uh, island chain right over here. Okay. Well, you gotta have some uh, serious serious brass, like some brass nerves right here. Guys like Gunther Preen and his. Uh, his sailors flow all the way up here, right in this vicinity area. This is where the the Royal Oak was uh, anchored. Again, nerves of steel coming in through British home ports. And there you have it. Okay. I know, actually, the next slide is kind of important. Okay. Okay, the home fleet from Scapa Flow. Uh, ships of King George V, uh, carry, ca aircraft carriers victorious, and battlecruiser uh, repulse, and five cruisers set sail to intercept the Bismarck, along with our good old friends, Task Force H uh, from uh, Gibraltar uh, Harbor. Our right, Task Force H, uh, these were the guys that were ordered to sink the uh, the French anchor ships at Algeria. Now, of course, uh, these sailors didn't take that order lightly, though, but you'd be the judge. You want these ships to be in uh, Kriegsmarine hands and have a launch pad for an invasion on southern England? Nope. Churchill couldn't have that chance. Churchill couldn't risk that. And again, he really didn't take that order lightly. I don't care what, I don't care what anyone says. Okay, so the uh oh sorry, uh number five. Okay, so number two was uh German ships detected by Norfolk and Suffolk. Number three was uh the Battle of Denmark Straits, number four was uh the HMS Hood uh that was sank. Uh number five, uh twenty fifth of May, uh Bismarck and Prince Eugen part ways. Uh, this is their way to uh, evade pursuers. So they both trying to get back to uh, the French ports for repairs. Uh, so on the 25th of May, uh, Prince Eugen starts, sa starts to sail back to the uh, the French-occupied port of Brest. Uh, okay, so 26th of May, uh, 10.15. Bismarck spotted by a uh, Catalina flying boat. And, uh, sorry, number 8, uh, 26th of May, uh, here we go. At uh, at nine oh five, 
uh, the Swordfish biplanes I just showed you right here, uh, from like both Ark Royal and uh, Victoria's. They launch, and these <laughs> these obsolete biplanes were pretty much World War One era planes. They practically <laughs> out Bismarck pretty good, like <laughs> it up so bad to the point where. The Bismarck like had a uncontrollable spin. It, it was it was turning uncontrollably, making it making it an easy target for for the rest of the ships that are ready to intercept. And so, uh, number nine, twenty uh, seventh of May at twenty two forty, uh, the Bismarck sinks. So there you have it. Uh 27th of May, 1941. Uh the Kriegsmarine's beloved Bismarck sinks at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so this is, is a severe blow to the Kriegsmarine. And this pisses this pisses off Adolf Hitler like nine, 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 nine. Admiral Raider, you promised me that you will give me huge success with this ship. You're fired. In fact, Dunitz, you're hired. So later on, uh, he, he hires Dunitz to uh, be the, um, the commander-in-chief of the entire Kriegsmarine, not just the U-boat fleet. So Dunitz is like, gotcha, bitch! Finally, I get my naval crown. I can get my 300 U-boats, finally. No, but is it too late? So let's talk about the Kriegsmarine strength before the war. Uh, actually, between 1939 and 1940. Okay, so altogether they had two battleships. I'm uh, sorry, two battleships, two aircraft carriers. Oh, yeah, like. What? What the fuck? Oh, yeah, the Germans, they had aircraft carriers. Though, but they were never deployed. And I'll tell you why. So, and, and 10 cruisers, 34 destroyers, and 57 U boats. Okay, reason why these aircraft carriers were never deployed because you need a series of battleships and cruisers to escort them. Otherwise, the aircraft carriers will be a sitting duck. So they just sat there in port, never deployed. Okay. Now, this is another interesting, sophisticated piece of machinery the Enigma. Uh, first introduced in 1926. Uh, this is the standard equipment for some German armed forces. At the time, uh, they were using the two ro two rotor Enigma. Okay, each uh, well, I'm about to tell you later on. Uh, later in 1935, uh, the three rotor was introduced. Uh, it was used in the Battle of Poland and the Battle of France, and it proved very, very, very successful in Germans' uh, blitzkrieg tactics. Uh, so, uh, before the war, uh, three Polish ciphers, I'm oh, sorry, three Polish cipher experts uh, tried to replic replicate the Enigma uh, using both mathematics and electronics. Uh, when uh, Poland was invaded, uh, these uh, scientists, these, ci these cipher experts, uh, retreated back to France, I believe, and tried to pass this along to uh, French and British military. And okay, so the Enigma, it had three, later four rotors. Okay, so Enigma had three parts. Okay, the one part you have a keyboard to type in your regular messages, uh, your plain letters. Uh, another uh, part was the scrambling units of three and the four rotors I was telling you about. And each of these uh, can scramble a word by 21 times. So turn the plain letters into code. So instead of me saying, hey, welcome to my podcast, like the video on your way in. Uh, but the Enigma, it would say like, instead of like, you know, saying what it is, it would say like, you know, QXXHFDCV. And like, what the hell kind of crap is this? Oh, yeah, it's all in code. And okay. And the third one, 
you have a illuminated lamp board for displaying the enciphered letters. So instead of uh, instead of uh, trying to type an N, the enciphered letter will type in a G. And of course, uh, other armies had various uh, various their own various versions of it. Okay, from left to right, you have the Morse code transmitter. Uh, again, compliments to uh, Smithsonian. Uh, remember what I told you back in my previous episode that um, the Russian back in the First World War, uh, the Russians really, really didn't uh, encipher their messages. So how they communicate each other was via Morse code. So but German intelligence would intercept these because, like, oh, we understand Morse co- Russian Morse code. You know, it's some of what the Russians are saying. Logs it down, passes on to uh, their own German commanders. And of course, this is why you need to uh, insight for your messages. So, the Japanese at the middle, uh, their purple machine. This is how they uh, communicated uh, back and forth uh, before and after during Pearl Harbor. Uh, there were various there were various versions of this. Um, it, it differed from the Enigma. Uh, it had telephone switches instead of rotors to insight for the messages. And of course, last but not least, the Americans use Navajo, <laughs> the Navajo people, and why do you think? Uh, why Navajo? Well, the language itself—it's so rare; no one else in the world speaks it. In fact, uh, they use Navajo code talkers to talk to one another, to uh, encipher troop movements, artillery coordinates, whatever, and it will achieve success against their fight against Japan. Okay, why don't I show you right here? Okay, these two pictures right here—the um, the Colossus calculating machine. This is the uh, the cipher machine that Alan Turing himself, the next man, to show that is displayed. Uh, rebuilt this machine from the old um, designs from the Polish experts. I was cipher experts. I was telling you previously. I was excuse me wow i cannot talk today <laughs> let me start that again god damn such a dumbass <laughs> okay so Turing built this machine based on the previous designs from the polish cipher experts that went to exile and so therefore uh Beshley park uh, located in buckinghamshire uh, the, the British government assembled uh, mathemat- uh, mathematicians, uh, mathematicians uh, linguists, linguists, scientists to form a code and cipher school. Um, now of course, this uh, <laughs> this magnificent nerd right here, Alan Turing, was the man for the job. Um, okay, so he used this um, program known as Cribs. Uh, Cribs. And this uh, program would um, would find repeated phrases or letters. Like often, there uh, when uh, German U-boat commanders would have to report back to Dunitz because again, Dunitz was a punctual man. He needs to know who, what, where, why, and how kind of thing. And okay, so whenever U-boats trying to con- trying to communicate between each other and back to Berlin. A uh, what do you call it? A um, a radio frequency would broadcast. So British intelligence would intercept. Like, oh, there's a lot of radio activity coming on in this part of the Atlantic. So if we can actually figure out exactly what they're saying, we can actually divert our convoys away from that. Okay, these repeated phrases would say uh, letters like uh, weather or German for Wetter. And always at the end of the messages, it would say, Hail Hitler. Or, Hail Hitler. <laughs> yeah, but if, if they can get those two phrases, like, they, they got the reference point right there. But unfortunately, uh, these code, they, like the Enigma code changes every day. So it it's hard to keep up for the people at, uh, at Bachelor Park to uh, keep up. All right. Okay. 
So the U-boat war. Uh, well, at the start of the war, uh, U-boat attacks on British supply lines were effective, though, but they were limited. Limited because, again, uh, Tunis really didn't have his 300 U-boats that he really, really wanted. No, oh, but okay, everything changed, and the Battle of the Atlantic tipped into the Germans' favor after the fall of France. Uh, therefore, when the Kriegsmarine again had access to French, French ports of uh, Brest, Lorient, Saint Nazaire, La Rochelle, and Bordeaux, also Toulon and Vichy, France. And these new uh, these new U boats that uh, that the Germans have. Uh, actually, you know what? Hang on. You, you want you guys want to see what a German U boat looks like? I can show you guys. All right. All right. All right, you have right here. Okay. If you guys can see that right there, okay, that's this is your German U boat. In case you have a general idea, in case uh, 25, I assume that's U boat U, U 25. Okay. Anyway, uh, the U-boat war, okay. These new German U-boats, they weren't like the ones from the First World War that was sinking like random like ships left, right, and center. Uh, these new U-boats were designed secretly in the Netherlands. Okay, remember I told you uh, the Germans were secretly violating the Treaty of Versailles by slowly building back up its military? Okay, they were secretly... Uh, Designing U boats and during the 1920s, uh, German uh, engineers uh, they went over the, over to the net the uh, the Netherlands, uh, studied on how uh, the Dutch, uh, how how the Dutch would build their ships, and therefore designed the U boat out of um, Dutch naval te tech advances. And okay, so. How did doing its challenge these uh, these merchant ships? Okay, instead of uh, there is U boats just randomly sinking ships in the ocean like quote unquote lone wolves, uh, he designed a system called the Wolf Pack system. Okay, so let's just say that for for example, this is your um, okay. This is your convoy, and these these four fingers represents like the U boats. Okay, let's say the guy in the middle, I uh, text the convoy. He would communicate with his uh, fellow U boats via Enigma, and the ships would actually close in, and together they go for the kill, like a wolf pack. Now you get what I'm saying. Okay, so. This is uh, done with precise teamwork within the U-boat fleet. And okay, so this is how, uh, again, this is how doing its, um, what do you call it, um, uh, boosted his uh, his U-boat recruitment and his uh, request for 300 U-boats. Uh, stuff like this, uh, his wolf pack, like the term wolf pack itself, he would use it as a propaganda tool with, uh, I think, uh, help of uh, Gibbles as well. Uh, no, but it, it like the term itself kind of like you know made made it exciting, exotic, and dangerous. And it it boosted it boosted recruitment. That's for sure. Just like the um, I remember uh, this uh, United States Marine Corps uh, recruitment channel back at the uh, I think this was after nine eleven. Uh, I remember this commercial was uh, this was back at the time when I watched uh, WWF wrestling. 
and I had the USA channel. And this is how I know. Uh, okay, I remember this commercial was uh, this knight slaying a dragon. And at the end of the commercial, uh, this knight kind of turns into uh, this marine and uh, dress blues. And next thing I know is uh, United States Marine Corps, enroll today or enlist today, whatever, right? And apparently that that commercial boosted recruitment. And this is what uh, Dunitz exact. This is what exactly what Dunitz did right here. He uses the wolf pack term to boost his recruitment. So, but life on the U boat wasn't really as glamorous as you think it was, because you're uh, cramped up and it can't. Like it's like a, you're in a can of sardines and it's barely enough room to move. And then when you're at uh, battle stations, uh, this is when you have to go dead silent. And you have to stay sound for 24 to 48 hours. And, and they have a, a single filtration system. So when they're silent, silent for a long period of time, uh, apparently the, the uh, it's so intense, like the air itself, you can actually cut it with a knife. Uh, and uh, what do you call it? Um, fresh water was a luxury. So therefore, shaving was disencouraged. So that's why you see uh, uh, U-boat sailors after the tour. You see them with like huge, like Grizzly Adams beards. Yeah, because they they don't shave. They can't because like shave with what salt water? Yeah, that, that ain't gonna happen. Like <laughs> that, <laughs> they just grow it out. And uh, each oh, if you're on a long tour in a U-boat. Uh, the camaraderie with one another builds within the U-boat sailors. It's like uh, they're 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 like one family. Like if if one guy gets depressed, everyone gets depressed. If one guy's happy, everyone's happy. And yeah, as long as you have a uh, good captain, everything's good. Okay. So the uh, the Royal Navy uh, relied on the ASDAC system, ASDIC, which is a uh, anti-submarine radar uh, to locate U-boats on the surface. On the surface, but they can't detect them when they're submerged. Uh, so that's why they have use uh, use sound wave systems. Uh, so the sound wave sound wave systems were used to uh, detect uh, submerged U-boats using sound. So again, that's why a uh, U-boat sailors were good at staying silent, being quiet for 20, 24 to 48 hours. Well, these world, these world Navy uh, sailors trying to find, of course, World Canadian Navy sailors trying to find these U-boats. Okay. And these are the U-boat aces I was telling you about. Okay, take a good, good look at that. Okay, you have the top three. Otto Kashmir, Wolfgang Luke, and Eric Schroff. And of course, you have number nine, our beloved Gunther Prien. Okay, so keep it there for a bit. Okay, this guy right here, Otto Kashmir, uh, joined the Kriegsmarine in 1930. Uh, this guy is practically the poster boy for the Kriegsmarine. This is uh, Dunitz's uh, pride and joy right here. Because he ended up being the most successful submarine commander, and of any navy of any kind uh, during during the Second World War, uh, his record was a sinking forty seven ships, uh, which is a uh, two hundred se- over two hundred seventy three thousand tons uh, during his sixteenth patrols. Uh, known to be as the Wolf of the Atlantic, Oof. like this guy was feared. Unfortunately, at his 16th and final tour, uh, his luck ran out. At March 1941, uh, submarine U-99 was sunk during a convoy battle. So, but he survived with some uh, with some of his crew members. But unfortunately, uh, he was captured and was kept in captivity for six years. Uh, but a- ended up becoming an admiral of the West German Navy after the war. Uh, which is the the Deutsche Marine? Of course, these pictures that I showed right here. Uh, these are the weapons that were combating the U-boats. Okay, you. I'm gonna go uh, right to left. Okay, 
So on the right side, you have your traditional depth charge. So these things will sink to the bottom of the ocean at a certain depth and would explode. I'm going to show you a video of it uh, later on. Okay, uh, the Hedgehog. Uh, the Hedgehog, these are tw like 24 of these will be launched at a time. Um, this is like another step. Because uh, we need to uh, develop newer toys, newer weapons to challenge these U-boats. So, Hedgehog's one of them. And last but not least, you have the Squid Depth Charger. Okay, so, instead of just launch them, three of these will be launched at a time. Okay. So, anyway. If uh, Judith estimated that if he could uh, sink at least 750 tons of uh, Allied shipping per month, he can knock Britain out of the war. Uh, of course, if he had three his 300 U-boats off the bat. Uh, okay, so Germans had the upper hand for more than three years, from 1939, 1941, and then 1942 kind of tipped back to the Allied side, which I will tell you later on. Okay. So, Churchill is desperate. Britain is desperate. Like, we need help. Like, even though Britain was had the most powerful navy at the time, it was spread so thin across the world that it, like, it, it, it couldn't, it couldn't help. Okay, so, therefore, okay. Uh, so, he called upon nations, and of course, Canada. Can Canada was, uh, actually, hang on for a sec. Uh, sorry about that. Anyway, um, okay, where was I? Uh, okay, so Canada was the first nation to uh, call upon the um, the ships. I oh, sorry, the ships uh, to call upon uh, Churchill's call, and so Canada at the time, uh, it was uh, like we, we were um, very, 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 very committed uh, to Britain, especially to this war, because we know that if Britain gets knocked out, like we're we're, we're kind of practically next. So. At the time, Canada was very, very close to Britain, so Canada and the Canadian people were very, very behind in the war effort. So, we uh, mass-produced these ships called Corvettes. Uh, these uh, 1,000 ton ships uh, were, uh, I, how you say it, um, were slow and horribly uncomfortable for uh, for its crew, but however, it helped uh, combat German U-boats at the time. Uh, they carried enough anti-sub weapons to actually combat these uh, combat the U-boats. Uh, air cover was actually provided as well, uh, leaving a hundred eighty thousand square mile. Okay, I dropped the gun there for a second. <laughs> okay, air cover was provided. Uh, you have uh, airplanes taking off from Newfoundland, uh, tip of Newfoundland to the tip of uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, though, but these. Uh, Planes can only go so far, leaving a 180,000 square mile gap in the ocean. So it's a safe haven for U-boats. That way they can surface, congregate with one another, and whatnot. Okay. This is your beloved Canadian Corvette. So, all right. There you go. And we produce, mass produce a whole bunch of this. And Copeland's to the Canadian War Museum, uh, for one Vimy Road in Ottawa, Ontario. Okay. Uh, before I show you the, uh, the next video, uh, I want to tell you that, um, okay, so remember what I told you that, uh, Churchill needed help. Okay. Canada stepped up. Don't buy it. It's still not enough. Like, we're losing, like, Britain is still losing merchant ships to the point where it's really, really, they're really, really feeling it from home. Um, like, the supermarkets that they were once uh, filled with food, um, there's not a lot of that now. In fact, uh, they're kind of in a brink of starvation. So, but Churchill uh, releases, releases the, a program called uh, Dig for Victory. Uh, Dig for Victory is uh, Britons would find a piece, uh, a, a patch of land and would grow whatever. 
uh, grow uh, fruits, vegetables, whatever, grow, grow their own food and ration them. And so this helped. And it rallied people saying, yeah, we're behind Churchill. We're behind this war. We're behind uh, in, the, in the defeat of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi maniacs. So, yeah. In fact, Churchill went as far as risking his life. Okay. Remember I told you that uh, merchant ships were being sunk left, right, and center in the Atlantic? He got on board on one of these ships and set sail to meet Franklin Dean Roosevelt for the first time himself. And so he took a big risk. This is how desperate Churchill is. Like, he needed help. And so he meets FDR over at Placenta Bay in Newfoundland, uh, basically saying, you know, I need help. You got to help me out. And FDR knew the threat of Nazism in Europe. Oh, but the American public at the time, being so isolationist, really, really didn't want to be a part of the war. And in fact, that they didn't want to be part of another European affair. Uh, and so they really wanted to just stay out of the war. But however, FDR still helped Churchill anyway. He gives uh, Churchill uh, some World War I destroyers as part of his uh, his Lend-Lease program. This Lend-Lease program is, um, he gives uh, weapons to, uh, what was the materials to Britain and later later the Soviet Union um, in exchange for, like, you know, them paying them back. For instance, um, Britain had to uh, lease its uh, ports to the United States Navy for 99 years. So that's how today uh, you have uh, American ports and Great Britain. That was part of uh, FDR's agreement with uh, Winston Churchill. And, okay, so you're thinking, okay, you're probably like, but America hasn't declared war on Germany yet. Yes, you're right. Uh, so uh, FDR kind of like, he had this uh, thing of twisting his words around. Um, he called it um, accompanying, not escort. He, he made he made those words like completely different with one another. Like, he, like you're trying to compare the cow to a horse. Like, it just doesn't work. We're accompanying the escorts. We're not, sorry, we're not, we're, sorry, thinking, we're accompanying the merchant ships. We're not escorting, we're accompanying. And so Hitler really couldn't risk a war with America. And even though some of these uh, World War I destroyers were sunk during these accompanying the merchant ships. And of course, that kind of changed after uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. Uh, therefore, America declared war on the Axis powers. Um, in retaliation, the U.S. declared war on Germany themselves. Uh, so therefore, I'm making these accompanying ships fair game. So now, America's all in now. They're in the war. Okay. Before I show you this, um, I want to tell you, um, Dunitz dispatches long-range U-boats to strike U.S. ports, uh, pretty much uh, bringing the, um, the the fight to U.S. waters. I will tell you more about the um, the port, like the name of the ports later on. Okay. So in retaliation, the uh, U.S. being a resourceful nation starts pumping up ship production. So every every ship that uh, the U-boats sink, another will be replaced. Sometimes two. And okay. Uh, this video I'm about to show you, uh, I have this uh, posted on my uh, my page or on YouTube. Uh, I think this is uh, my um, one more short episode. I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, this is a video of a Canadian Corvette sinking a German U-boat. So, hope you enjoy. Contact 340, pilot reporter, sir. Tell the radar 
They're submerging. Stand by depth charges. Set pattern A. Stand by depth charges. Set pattern A. Fire. Fire one. Fire two. All right, there you have it. Okay, that is your basic demonstration of a Canadian U-boat combating a... Sorry, I can't even... A Canadian Corvette combating a German U-boat. <laughs> okay. So the... Um, everything kind of changed somewhat. Um, like, the Allies kind of cracked... The Allies did crack the three-road Enigma code. It... It happened on, um, I'm trying to figure out the date. No, okay, it was, let me start this. Okay. The first Star uh, 3 World Enigma was captured, uh, by the Royal Navy, uh, from our good old friend, uh, Lieutenant, uh, Fritz Julius Lemp, the guy who sank the Athenia by mistake. Um, when he was combating, uh, merchant ships, uh, his, uh, U boat, U 110, took catastrophic hits. Uh, he abandoned orders to abandon the ship and just pretty much left like everything behind, thinking that the, the ship would sink instantly, but it doesn't. In fact, um, he risks his life and doubles back via he tries to physically swim back to the U boat trying to uh recover the um the classified documents, but unfortunately for him, he does not survive the swim. And therefore, um, the Royal Navy captures U boat 110 intact along with uh, it's Enigma, and therefore, Bessie Park going, Gotcha, bitch, got three, cut the uh, three world Enigma, and now they can listen to in to exactly what the U boats are saying to one another. But they do not divert all of their convoys, in fact, um. An ultimatum had to be made. Not an ultimatum, a, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a ruthless calculus had to be made. Like, you know, uh, sacrifice a hundred so thousands can be saved. And that's what they did. So they, the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Navy kind of had to, or the United States Navy had to make some sacrifices. They had to sacrifice smaller convoys so bigger convoys can. Divert the uh, the U boat attacks, and so it was a very very hard decision for the Allies to make, though. But it was either that or let the Germans find out, and they changed the entire coding system, which they eventually did, because everything is going all good before Bessley Park, until uh, Carl Dunitz kind of quote unquote smells a rat in the midst. No, he doesn't know that uh, U-110 was sunk. Uh, like he, he knew, like he thought that U-110 U was sunk along with the Enigma. Though he doesn't know that its Enigma is uh, at Bessie Park's hands. And so, though, but he changes the codes anyways. Um, creates the, the four-world version, which I showed you at the previous slide. Uh, again, each, uh, each, uh, rotors, uh, can, uh, multiply the code by 21 times or 26 times. And so when, uh, the four rotors were, four rotor enigmas weren't introduced, 
uh, Bachelor Park went dark. And so, therefore, they, they're, you know, like, what do you call it? The, uh, the tip was back in the Creeks Marine's hands. Though, but therefore, Bachelor Park went dark and could no, no, no longer intercept U boat communications. Uh, of course, that all changed back uh, October 1942 when U boat U559 was captured by another World Navy ship off, off the coast of Egypt. Uh, this four wrote it, and they, actually, the, the code books were captured. And Bachelor Park again, gotcha, bitch. <laughs> Uh, find out what the U boats are saying, and once again, the tip of the balance falls back to the Allies. All right, I just want to see something for a sec, but anyway, okay, changing tactics now. Okay, this is interesting. Okay. Desperate calls, I'm sorry, desperate calls comes for desperate measures. Okay, the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, or RATU, W-A-T-U, was uh, assembled at uh, Derby House, Liverpool. Uh, this was led by uh, a captain named Captain Gilbert Roberts and the women of the War- Women's World Nav- Naval Service, known as the RENS, W-R-E-N-S. Uh, these ladies would play huge tactical board games at this at, at a huge wooden floor, uh, they would mimic uh, past U boat attacks. Uh, they would again, they'll play huge games of battleship and trying to uh, develop see develop any patterns you of U boat attacks because, on average, uh, U boats would sink at least four merchant ships per per day or per patrol, whatever. And so they study for the attacks from data from past uh, U-boat attacks. And so from all this data they gathered up, uh, these women, they created a uh, an op- a, uh, a plan of their own, uh, this game of their own called uh, Operation Raspberry. As you know, them blowing a <laughs> you raspberry to Adolf Hitler himself. And okay, so... This tactic would be uh, pretty much uh, bring bring the fight to the U-boat. Bring the fights to the U-boats themselves. Okay, so the Raspberry kind of rep- represents uh, the Corvettes, the uh, the frigates, the anti-sub ships, and Adolf Hitler, Hitler himself uh, represents uh, the U-boats. Okay, so with these new submarine weapons that I showed you previously, uh, the Squid Depth Lock char- Charger, the Hedgehog, etc. And okay. Uh, the first captain to test these run tactics was uh, not uh, not only then Captain Johnny Walker himself. And of course, uh, if you're like, <laughs> Captain Johnny Walker, is, is that a whiskey named after him? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> and this guy is known as the U-Boat Killer. So, U-Boat Aces, meet Johnny Walker. Your worst friggin' nightmare. Ho, 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 man. And so, he, guys like Johnny Walker would put these tactics into use, these rent tactics. And these tactics that the women created uh, proved very, very useful for each scenario that these that the, that the Royal Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy captains had to face against U-boats. And I'm going to show you another video right here. All right. Uh, this is ship I'm about to show you. Uh, this is like a one level up. Uh, from the Corvettes. This is the uh, HMCS Swanee. Oh, oh, sorry, the Swansea. Uh, involved in the destruction of four U-boats, the frigate HMCS Swansea was one of the World Canadian Navy's effective vessels. Uh, introduced in 1943, uh, frigates like this uh, were better armed and had longer range than your average Corvettes. They became the Navy's main submarine weapons. And of course, you got your hedgehog I was telling you about. I think I should read that. Introduced in 1943, the hedgehog mortars uh, supplied uh, supplemented traditional depth charges thrown on Canadian warships. They can hurl 24 spigot, bo- spigot bombs uh, ahead of the ships, permitting more accurate attacks.
Ooh, look at that bad boy. Again, compliments to uh, the Canadian War Museum. All right. Now, let's see over here. Okay, so this guy over here. I'm Ernest King, uh, the head of the United States Navy. Uh, this guy is known to be intelligent, but <laughs> very arrogant, because if this guy isn't, um, you know, gaslighting his subordinates, he's hitting on his wife. So he was kind of a so, uh, sh he was chauvinistic like that. And to add insult to complete injury, uh, he really dislikes the, the British. In fact, he ignored both British and Canadian advice on how to combat these U-boats. Uh, though, therefore, he, he's just like, you, I don't have to listen to you, blah, blah, blah. But that, that, that kind of costed him, uh, because, um, uh, black, um, what was it, uh, Germans, uh, okay, Germans had their happy times. You have their first happy time, which is, uh, their celebration of the U boat aces, and their second happy time, which is, um, uh, what do you call uh, German U-boats striking U.S. ports? Okay, remember I told you on how uh, Dunitz uh, uh, orders uh, long-range U-boats to attack U.S. ports? Well, Admiral King really should have ordered... Uh, well, I should got the, uh, the list right here. Sorry, people, just bear with me, with me for a second. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, there were four ports in the U.S. You have the New York port. I uh, sorry, New York City. Uh, you have the Mississippi Submarine Valley. Uh, and then you have a couple of ports in Georgia, and I think North Virginia as well. Um, okay. So the U-boats attack ships while they're at anchor. All these anti-submarine ships, all these merchant ships, and these submarines, they they can pick them off very easily. Because of um, the sil the silhouette they uh, they they bring out, because the bright city lights, such as uh, you know, they call Atlantic City. That's a huge example. Okay, so um, Admiral Ernest King should have like ordered like you know a a a light discipline or, or, or a light cur a a light curfew. No, but the, the at the time the U.S. didn't want to do it because they didn't want to scare away their tourism. Oh, but hey. Go figure. They they rather uh, save their tourist economy than th the lives of their own sailors. Go figure, right? But it actually costed them because, in fact, uh, when the U boat strikes, uh, it this was known as their second Pearl Harbor. So at this point, uh, before um, when America declared war on Germany, you would think Britain would have more escorts. They actually had. Far less escorts now because of Americans' contribution in the Pacific, believing that Japan should be the principal enemy of the United States, not Germany. That all changed during Germany's second happy time. And the Americans were like, <laughs> that. In fact, we're committed. Let's get them both. And in fact, like Americans were very behind on attacking both Germany and Japan. And they're at this point, they were on board on the defeat Germany first strategy. And uh, these two planes I want to show you about. Okay. Uh, the, the Bristol uh, Blenheim. Uh, these are one of the the, uh, the planes that uh, combat U-boats, but they can only, only go so far. And the Avro Ensign as well. You can see your specifications. You can pause the video. So on and so forth. I can go through them all, though, but we're just going to fall asleep. <laughs> all right. When America declared war, uh, they supplied uh, B-24 Liberators. Actually, it, it... let me start that again. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> they didn't have these yet because Bomber Command, under the command of uh, Air Marshal Arthur Harris, uh, would rather use these heavy bombers to bomb the living <laughs> out of Germany. Believing that, you know, if we bomb it, if we bomb German cities enough, we will bomb it into into submission. And you're probably like, what? What the fuck? Isn't that exactly what Goring did 
when uh, I tried to bomb the UK in the submission, and it really didn't work. And said it had the opposite effect. Yeah. Uh, again, people are always fighting fighting the last war. Uh, but that all changed when Bomber Harris um, decided to grant uh, the Royal Navy long range bombers. One of them is the B 24 Liberator. Uh, it was completely stripped out of unnecessary gear, such as um, extra gun turrets, whatever. Uh, those were replaced by extra fuel tanks and anti submarine weapons. And a uh, somewhat of a uh, spotlight that they can actually see U boats during night. So the U boats are no longer safe in this Atlantic Gap I was telling you about. Because that Atlantic Gap finally closes in. And therefore, it just pick, picks off the U boats. And which leads to Black May. Black May. Uh, the RAF went from using the Avro Anson and the Bristol Bel Blenheims to the American B-24 Liberators. These puppies bad boys right here. All right. Uh, this, therefore, closed in a bit Atlantic for good. Uh, 41 U-boats, representing 25% of the U-boat fleet, were sunk in May 1943. Again, Black May. This is like the most heaviest losses ever in the Kriegsmarine. Okay, at this point, due to Allied air cover and very, very well organized uh, escorts, thanks to the Renz tactics and guys like Johnny Walker, uh, Admiral Dunitz was forced to pull his main U-boat fleet out of the Atlantic, going to, going to Adolf Hitler saying, dude, I'm sorry, I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, like, our, our losses are too heavy. Like, our U-boat aces are gone. They're either killed or captured. And the new recruits now are inexperienced. And they're practically lambs to the slaughter. Sorry, lambs to the slaughter. So, he had to pull away. Uh, of course, the uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say the, uh, the, Atlantic, the battle of the Atlantic wasn't over. It still happened because you still have, like, U-boats trying to, like, sink, like, as much, you know, yeah, you know, as many as merchant ships as it can, because Dunas was even like, okay, even if you sink one ship, it helps. No, but of course, like history tells that it really didn't help him out at all. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna show you the top three reasons why the Kriegs Marine failed. So Round one fight. He didn't have his enough U-boats. So if he would have had his 300 U-boats off the jump, uh, he probably would have probably pulled it off. He probably would have like broke Britain into submission. Maybe. Maybe. Round two. Round two. Fight. Uh, reason number two. The merchant losses uh, pushed the Allies to the point where they uh, you know, went outside their the comfort zone, the personal bubble. They they started thinking outside the box, started creating like this anti-submarine tactics, these new weapons. That's what I showed you the uh, the hedgehog, the rems. And now, round three, fight. <laughs> and number three, probably figure it up, figure it up right now. Admiral Dunitz's micromanaging problem. Okay, remember what I told you that uh, he really wanted to know uh, his U-boats, like, you know, again, how much fuel they have, how much how much torpedoes they had left, um, how many ships they sunk, and where exactly they are. Uh, he wanted to know this, like, pretty much like every hour, not every hour, though, but that's kind of pushing the envelope, though, but it was frequent enough, so there's people at, at Bessley Park, Find the notes like, yep, uh huh, yep, oh yeah, dude, let's keep telling me all. And these, uh, <laughs> these, uh, what we call it, um, these cipher experts, they're, they're just laughing, they're just going, ha ha ha, you dumbass, <laughs> we can hear everything, okay. Send it to guys like Alan Turing, and Turing can congregate towards uh, British military command, and there you have it. 
And that's how the uh, Kriegsmarine failed. And there you have it. This is my presentation of the Battle of the Atlantic. So on your way in, like the video so I can level up the algorithm. And again, thank you for tuning in. Okay, uh, next uh, episode I will talk about... I'm going to shift my, uh, my direction towards the east. And by the east, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, the Coral Sea, and Battle of Midway. That should be interesting because, especially the Battle of Midway, because the Midway was a tipping point from Japan having the upper, upper hand to America having, having the upper hand. So, should be interesting. And, oh, I got a chat right here. Hey, Shmeebles. Dom the Marco. Marco. Hey, G, how's it traveling? Oh, I'm doing good, brother. I'm doing good. And all right, I uh, will let you guys go because this is the uh, the ending time of the show. So, in the meantime, I will see you guys next time. Um, Probably not going to be on Tuesday, though, but maybe next Tuesday because I got to get some notes going on. So, I oh, before I go, I got to show you this. Uh, th this is the uh, the graph statistics right here. I forgot to show you this. I'm sorry. I'm such a dumbass. <laughs> anyway, um, the sinking of the merchant ships month by month. All right. Okay, let's see right here. Uh, from January 1940 to December 1941, you can see the graphs on how it shoots up from the Battle of France from May 1940 from the summer 19 1940. And through the fall as well. And it continues. I look at the right graph. Uh, monthly U-boat losses. And this is interesting. Uh, if you look at 1943. Uh, far less uh, merchant ships were sunk. But a lot more U-boat ships were U-boat ships were sunk. You can pause it. Take a good look at it. But all right. Anyway, I got to get rid of this over here, except myself out. All right. And now that's all I have for you. <laughs> all right. Until next time, guys. Love you. Good night. <laughs>